in this video I'm going to show you how you can take a series of photos captured in something like the setup I've got here on the screen. So we've got a left hand, a centre and a right hand camera all set up to take photos continuously. So we end up with a range of photos that are all overlapping each other. Then we're going to take those into Agisoft Metashape and stitch them together to get a continuous mosaic of our transect. So let's get started. The first thing that we're going to do is to open a blank Agisoft Metashape project. Once we've got that open, I'm going to go right ahead and save it. So straight up to the save button. And I have a really specific file naming convention that I use. So it starts with the name of the camera or sensor that it's captured the, da the data, the DJI Osmo in this case, the location of data, long reef, T1 for transect one, and the date the data were captured, the 20th of October, 2021. So you see that I already have a folder with that name and that folder contains the photos that I'm going to use for the project. So it's important that I add the PSX extension, which is what you see down here as the Metashape project. Go ahead and save that. In the upper left hand corner, you'll see that at the top of the user interface saying that's the name of the project. So I'm not going to go into too much detail in terms of what the interface looks like. We're going to th step through a very specific workflow. So to do that, we want to go up to workflow and we've got options of adding photos, adding folders or going through a batch process. I'm not going to go through the batch process today. We'll talk about that later. So let's go ahead and add a folder of data. So let's have a look into this T1 folder. You'll see that I have it arranged in three separate folders where I have my center, my left and my right hand camera JPEGs. So that's important that I have those separate at this stage. So I'm going to go ahead and select the folder with all the subfolders within it. And it will give me another couple of options about how I want to import those. I want to use it as a single camera and add all images to one chunk. So I click OK on that. You'll see it gives me a dot on the map over here at 00, zero latitude longitude. That's OK because my data do not have GPS coordinates. Now, if I come over to the left hand side here in the workspace, which is sort of like a table of contents, I can now open this chunk and extend the cameras here. So you see at the moment it says I have zero out of 126 photos aligned. It's perfectly fine. But importantly, I have my three different cameras appearing as separate folders or camera groups. Now this is important as each camera may require its own slightly separate camera calibration. So it's important that the software sees them as different. So in my center, my left and my right JPEGs folder, they each have 42 folders, 42 photos, and I can expand that to see each of the individual photos. I can click on those. If I double click, it appears over here and just a single click will appear in that bottom left there. So once we have our data in the software, the next stage is going to be to align those pictures. So once again, I go up to workflow and you'll see that it's the next available choice. Everything else is grayed out. So I'm going to go ahead and click on align photos and it gives me some other options of what I need to do. So I'm going to expand the advanced options to start with and make sure that none of these things are ticked. I'm happy to stay with the default values here for the key points and tie points. And I want to make sure that I don't have the reference pre-selections ticked. This is if my data have GPS coordinates for them and they don't or they're guessing that everything's at zero, zero. So that's going to confuse the alignment. So I leave generic pre-selection ticked on and then I'm going to have a look at my accuracy. So I have a variety of different choices. The lowest accuracy will be the fastest run model. The highest accuracy will be the slowest run model. And sometimes you actually find that if you have a difficult data set, sometimes it works best to decrease the accuracy. For this one, we're going to start with high accuracy. So once I do that, I hit OK and let the software do its thing. Now, once that alignment has been completed, and that may take a little while, there's a couple of things that we want to check. First of all, the jobs window down the bottom tells me that the aligned photos has, has finished. I find this window really useful to remind me what steps I've done if I'm moving between different tasks. If you can't see the jobs window, if you just go up to view and then make sure that that's switched on, then you'll be able to find that there. Now, over on the left hand side in our workspace, we'll see that we have 126 out of 126 photos aligned. Now, this is excellent. We may not always do this well, particularly when we've got water in our scenes. So if we haven't 
had a situation where all photos are aligned, there will be a message that will pop up saying, hey, not all photos are aligned, please check. That's okay, come over and check. And as you can see, we've got 42 out of 42 for each of ours. But again, not a huge issue at this stage if we don't have full alignment. What we want to do next is to check what that alignment looks like. Now, it's a little bit useless looking at it at this in this scale, I guess. So what we want to do is press this button here, and that will zoom us to the photos, and you'll be able to see what it looks like. So I can just zoom in and out using the scroll bar on my mouse and check out where all those different photos are. If you're not seeing the photo footprints, we can switch those on by using our toolbar at the top, which you might see it along the top or you might need to pull it over like I've just done and you can see a couple of different options here and you can toggle those photos on and off. So what you're seeing at the moment in the background is the sparse point cloud. So this looks really good to me. Again, if you haven't had all the photos aligned, have a look at where you're missing photos. There might be a chunk out or it might be at the beginning of the transect or the end of the transect that hasn't aligned well. And at this point, you need to make a decision of if you're going to have another go at aligning. Now, it's really simple to have another try. And the, the reason that you may need to do this is because the alignment process works on random points. So what might work in one iteration doesn't work in the next. So there is some variability to expect there, particularly when we've got marginal data sets like these ones in water. So if you do need to rerun the alignment, just go back up to workflow, workflow, go to align photos, and this time make sure that you tick this button to, button to reset the current alignment. And you can either try with the exact same settings again, or opt for another one of the accuracy levels to try and force it to align. Now, I don't need to do that because I'm happy with my alignment. The next step in our workflow is to build our dense cloud. You'll see that's available here. That's going to allow us to create a digital elevation model with really good accuracy. So again, we've got an opportunity to choose different levels of quality, and we're going to stick with medium here. So as you, as you get the higher levels, it's, it's going to take more time to create that dense cloud. So medium is going to be, well, our happy medium. We'll leave the default parameters switched on here. Click OK and let's go. So we've just completed the dense point cloud and you probably won't see anything appear immediately here. But if you go up to the toolbar and you can click on the dense point cloud option here and you'll see a lot of those points get filled in. So you'll be able to zoom in and out again, just using the wheelie on my mouse to see what that looks like. And you'll see the difference between the dense one and the sparse one and how that's going to then affect the digital elevation model that's created off the back of this one. Now, if you want to remove these footprints, you can just go over and remove them so that you can be have a better look at the point clouds there as well. So the next stage is to look at creating the digital elevation model. But if we go up to workflow, you'll see that it's still grayed out. And this is because there's no scale or coordinate system on our model as it is just yet. But that's fine because that's something that we can actually fix. And you may have seen already that there are some yellow set squares that are visible in the photos. And we're going to use those to scale our model. So what I want to do is to come over here to my workspace and I'm going to work with the center JPEGs as that was the middle of where we were snorkeling. And if I click on each one and use my down arrow to move along these photos, you'll start to see that down the bottom here, this set square is just starting to appear. So I want to find the photo where that one is in the middle of the shot there. I'm going to double click on that and open it up and you'll see it appear over here. Now what I want to do is zoom in again using my wheelie on my mouse and right click on one of the corners of the set squares and add a marker and then I'm going to add a second marker and I'm going to create a scale between here because I know that this is 30 centimeters. Now if I was looking at the full transect instead of just this small subset of it, I would continue working my way through the photos to find the next set square and do the same. So I would get points three and four, five and six, etc. Now once I've got that, what you'll be able to see is that it's now created this folder over here in the workspace and it's got my points one and two. 
So what I want to do is to click on the first one, hold the shift key and click on the second, and then either right click and create scale bar or use the button up the top here to create that scale bar. And you'll see that it's created a new folder here and I have my first scale bar. So now the next thing to do is to come down to the bottom and click on the reference tab. And if the reference tab isn't there, just go up to view and click reference so that you have that available. So you can see a lot of information here about the coordinates of each of the different photos, all sorts of stuff. What I want to do is to create the distance that this represents just here. So down here within my scale bars, I've seen my first scale bar here, and you may have multiples if you've, click, if you've got multiple set squares or whatever that you can scale in your images. And I'm going to double click under distance and put in 0.3, because I know that's 30 centimeters for, that for the size of this particular set square. Now what I want to do then is to come up to the top and I'm just going to extend out my workspace here so that I can see this settings button. I'm going to click on the settings and change this from being WGS84 because it is not a known datum. There's, there's no set datum for this and just change this one to local coordinates and leave the rest of the parameters there and hit OK. Now the next thing that is really important to be able to do is to click on this update transform. So once I click on that, we'll, it will update itself and you may not see any difference. And again, that's perfectly fine. But what you will see when we now come up to workflow is that we have the opportunity to build the digital elevation model. So I'm now going to click on to build the DEM and you'll see I have this option for using local coordinates or if, if you're using drone data or, or other GPS to, in, in situ data as well, you can use the actual coordinate system that you're using. But local coordinates is fine because I don't know, I don't have anything better at this case, at this stage. It asks what the source data I'm going to use for my digital elevation model, and I want that to be my dense cloud. That's just what I created before. That's going to give me the best digital elevation model. And then once I've done that, I'm just going to click OK. And that's going to run. So creating the digital elevation model is actually quite a quick process. You'll see down the bottom here, it's just built the digital elevation model. So I'm going to kill this photo up here. I don't need to see that anymore and change back to my workspace because that's a little bit cleaner for me to look at. And then I want to have a look at my digital elevation model. So up the top here where it says model, I'm going to go next to that and click on the button for ortho. And here's my digital elevation model, which I think looks really amazing. And I can zoom and pan and check all that out. At this stage, though, I do want to have a look and see if there's any weird artifacts. And for example, this little bit down the bottom here, maybe I don't necessarily want that in my digital elevation model. You might have other bits and pieces that are kind of scattered around the outside. So it's important to then actually go back a step and clean up the dense point cloud if you see some of these artifacts. So this bit here, I want to see if I can tidy up the bottom bit. So let's go back to the model and have a look at our dense point cloud, which again, swapping between the sparse and the dense here and see what I've got down the bottom and see if there's some things that I can clean up here. So I use my middle mouse button or the, the scroller to click and move that. And what I can actually see is that there's a there's a couple of points out here within my dense point cloud and that's what I think might be causing this little bit out here which I don't want so I want to get rid of those so over in my model what I'm going to do is to use this selection tool so you can buy a rectangle circle or just do a free form I'm just going to do a rectangle and keep it nice and tidy and I'm going to select these points that I don't want to form part of my digital elevation model. So once I've selected them, I'll just use the delete button on my keyboard to get rid of those. I might tidy up a couple little bits around the bottom here as well. And again, you may not need to do this. It just sort of depends on what your data set looks like. And if you select stuff that you don't want, just click off and then have another go. So I delete those little bits around there and maybe I'll pop back to my rectangle and keep that nice and sharp just along the bottom. So once I've done that, then I'm just going to go straight back up to workflow and build my digital elevation model again with the exact same parameters. That's all fine and click OK. And then once that's done, we can reevaluate what that output product is. And let's see if it's a little bit better.
So we've got these little sharp bits here, but no longer that little funky bit over there. So this is something that you can continue to play with to tighten things up just a little bit, but particularly if you've got extraneous bits that are really far out of the digital elevation model, because that will then affect what our author mosaic looks like in the end. So let's come back to workflow and finish this off. Because we've built our digital elevation model, or we could have built mesh, but we're keeping with digital elevation model at the moment, we now have the opportunity to build our author mosaic. So I'm going to click on that one. And you'll see it's already filled in. It should be geographic with our local coordinates. And let's choose what option we want for our surface, which for us is the digital elevation model. If you have created a mesh, that will allow you to do that. But the digital elevation model will give you a better result. If you don't have any scale coordinates, mesh will be your only option. So that all looks amazing. All I'm going to do is click OK and let that process run. So I've just seen the Build Author Mosaic finished popping up in my jobs list. So what I want to do now is to pop up to the menu bar at the top here. At the moment, we're visualizing the digital elevation model. So next to that, we're going to click on the button to visualize our author mosaic. And there we have it. Our author mosaic looks absolutely amazing. You'll see that the size of it does mimic the size and shape of the digital elevation model, which is why it was important to do that cleanup of the dense point clouds but we can move around and check that out and and I'm really really happy with that if there are any areas where you're not quite so happy with you can always go back to any of the previous stages and reconstruct them now usually the next step that you want to do is to be able to take your author mosaic and your digital elevation model out into some other software package for further analyses. So to do that, you just want to go up to file and through to export and choose to export your author mosaic. I usually export it as a TIFF and then export the digital elevation model as a TIFF as well. Just remember to save your project before you close it off. The only other thing to be aware of within that workflow is that you can automate each of these steps through the batch process. I'll show that in another video, but I think it's really instructive to go through just the individual steps until you really get the hang of what each step is doing and at which point you may need to go back and iterate, particularly if you have a challenging data set that you're work working with. So good luck creating your mosaics.